Hi there. Today's podcast is called Brain Chemistry and You, Understanding Your Mental Health in English. So let's talk about something psychological today. We know that you like these podcasts. And by the end of it, I'll share some information about this, which might interest you, which might be useful. Hello, I'm Hilary and you're listening to Adept English. We will help you to speak English fluently. All you have to do is listen. So start listening now and find out how it works. And if you like this podcast, don't forget that there are many more podcasts on our website at adeptenglish.com. You can download them in groups of 50, 100, 150 podcasts. Just imagine what that will do for your English language learning. Have you ever wondered how your life story and your brain chemistry shapes who you are? Welcome to this English lesson where we will dive into the fascinating world of psychology and mental health, all while polishing your English listening skills with a British accent. As a psychotherapist with over 20 years experience, I've met lots of people who face challenges like depression and anxiety. Our context, our life experience plays a crucial role in shaping our mental health. And this idea isn't just abstract theory. It's a reality for many people who have known what are called adverse childhood experiences in their lives, or ACEs for short. These experiences, whether they're stark or subtle, can make deep impressions in our minds. And ACEs often show up as mental health challenges in adulthood. So, this phrase in English, Adverse childhood experiences. Adverse, A-D-V-E-R-S-E, -E, means negative, harmful, unfavourable. And research backs up the idea that the more ACEs we have in childhood, the more likely we'll have mental health difficulties as an adult. This is a central idea in psychotherapy, but it's good that other scientific research now is backing this up. So when I say context, that's C-O-N-T-E-X-T, -E here I mean the person's circumstances, what their life is like. And that means what their current life is like. And that may be where many of the problems lie. But if there's nothing particularly problematic in their current life, we might look at a person's past and how their childhood experiences have shaped them and may still be influencing now particularly where there's trauma in the past, that can disrupt a person's present day life, even if that trauma happened a long time ago. Trauma, T-R-A-U-M-A, -A, means something horrible that happened to you, a horrible experience that was shocking, so much so that life doesn't seem the same afterwards. That's a trauma. And sometimes it's our ways of managing these difficult experiences our mechanisms, coping mechanisms that become the problem. They may have been the best ways we had at the time, but that doesn't mean that they're the best way of managing ourselves now. So contrary to what many believe, particularly in the US, but also in the UK too, I don't think that mental health issues like anxiety and depression are rooted in physical diseases of the brain or that they need medication like antidepressants to sort them out. While these medicines may have their place, it's much more important to understand our life stories rather than to rely on pharmaceutical medication. Medications like antidepressants may be an elastoplast for some people, a temporary solution perhaps, but long term it's better to find a different solution to mental health difficulties. Antidepressants haven't been tested for long-term use anyway, so we don't really understand the long-term effects, except by what people tell us. I think there are also unintended effects, and for some coming off this type of medication is very difficult. You only need to look at forums like survivingantidepressants.org to see that people have all kinds of problems with these medicines for mental health. And these aren't often discussed or known about by doctors. 
Anyway, most people don't want to take medication as a solution to their mental health problems. So I don't go with what you might call the mainstream medical model of mental health, where unhappiness, distress is automatically treated as though it were a physical disease of the brain. But, and you might find this surprising, what I do think is beyond any doubt is that your brain chemistry can and does affect your mental health. It's well known and accepted in the field of neuroscience that chemicals in the brain like serotonin, that's S-E-R-O-T-O-N-I-N, and dopamine, that's D-O-P-A-M-I-N-E, they affect our feelings and behaviour. I would go further and say that these neurotransmitters affect who we are, our personalities. Although the science of this is somewhat at the beginning, some scientists believe that some people naturally have more serotonin than others, and other people naturally have more dopamine than some. And there are other brain chemicals that play their part in who we are. Hormones, for instance, that's H-O-R-M-O-N-E-S, like testosterone or estrogen, they're hormones. Some may find this contentious, but I think that male and female hormones influence our personalities, how we feel, what motivates us, how we behave. And this happens probably, it's thought, by affecting the levels of our neurotransmitters. So that's the word for these chemicals, these substances in the brain, our neurotransmitters. That's N-E-U-R-O-T-R-A-N-S-M-I-T-T-E-R, -T -T -E neurotransmitter. These are chemical messengers that control lots of things like our heart rate our breathing, our sleep and our appetite, how hungry we are or not. Serotonin and dopamine, I've already mentioned, these are neurotransmitters which really affect our feelings and our behaviour towards other people. For instance, serotonin affects lots of processes in the body, but research also suggests that the more serotonin we have, the more socially motivated we are. That means the more we care about and take care of the people around us. Evidence also suggests that serotonin helps us to contain our aggression. That's A-G-G-R-E-S-S-I-O-N. Serotonin plays a part in containing our urge to hurt or harm other people. So if we have low serotonin, we may be more aggressive. And this is backed by animal studies. Lower serotonin animals are more likely to be aggressive to one another. And low serotonin lessens social motivation and cooperation. So to some degree, our neurotransmitters are affected by what we eat what we take into our bodies. This means food, but it also means potentially nutritional supplements. Let me explain the term. Nutrition, N-U-T-R-I-T-I-O-N, that's the science around the substances that we take into our body. So again, mainly food and the effects on our body and our health. So nutritional is the adjective. And the word supplement is a noun, S-U-P-P-L-E-M-E-N-T. And the word supplement literally means extra. So if you take a nutritional supplement, it might be something like vitamin C that you take in a tablet form if you don't feel you're eating enough oranges, perhaps. You're taking supplements, so it's extra, vitamin C extra to your ordinary diet. And there's a growing school of thought that nutritional supplements may have a part to play in helping people with their mental health difficulties. It's a new field. I looked into training courses in this area for people like me. And guess what? There aren't any yet because it's really new. They don't really exist yet because this is new thinking. But that nutrition can affect our mental health is starting to be more mainstream thought. Who would have thought that nutritional supplements like these might be the answer to some of our mental health problems? 
My prediction is that this field of research and this understanding will grow over the next 50 years or so, hopefully less time than that, maybe the next 20 years. I hope it does anyway. I don't want our understanding of mental health problems to continue barking up the wrong tree, as we say in English. There's an idiom for you to look up if you don't know it. Either way, if you're taking a nutritional supplement, it's something much more natural, closer to what you take in with your food anyway, so perhaps less likely to do you harm. So vitamin D is a real world example of a supplement that may be able to help with mental health for some people. We're much more aware of vitamin D since the pandemic because we were encouraged to take it for our immune system. That's I-M-M-U-N-E our body system for fighting off disease. In the UK, we're being told that most people are deficient in vitamin D in the winter because it's quite dark and we don't get a lot of sunshine. So that's become more accepted general advice. But if we just take vitamin D as an example, now as websites go, you can't get more mainstream medical model than WebMD. But here's what it says about vitamin D deficiency. These are a list of symptoms. Mood changes accompanied by overwhelming feelings of sadness and hopelessness. Fatigue. Forgetfulness. Loss of interest in activities that previously sparked excitement. Suicidal thoughts. Anxiety. Loss of appetite. Excessive weight loss or gain. And trouble sleeping. Well, those symptoms sound very familiar to me as symptoms of depression. Actually, there's a link between vitamin D and whether your brain makes enough serotonin. So I might suggest that if you have some of the symptoms on that list, which might get diagnosed as depression, perhaps it's worth trying vitamin D to see if this makes any difference. If it does, great. Maybe you keep taking it. And if it doesn't, then perhaps you just judge according to the level of sunshine you get in the wintertime, whether you need it or not. So some people's depression or low mood could be down to deficiency. That means lack of vitamin D. The problem is it's hard to research and prove this because depression and low mood have so many causes. One person's depression may be down to a lack of vitamin D, taking a supplement, may really help them, but lots of other people, the cause is something else, something different. They're not deficient in vitamin D, in other words. So depression and anxiety are not caused by the same things in everyone. And in each person, they probably have multiple causes. And the problem is scientific experiments and research by design have to assume that we're all the same. And particularly when it comes to the workings of our minds, we really aren't all the same. Vitamin D might work for some people and not for others. It doesn't make it invalid. But scientific experiments by design need to assume that we're all the same. So it's actually quite difficult to prove certain things scientifically, but it doesn't mean they're not true for some people. I think this is where evidence based medicine can fall down, especially around mental health issues. But being personally well informed and being prepared to do low risk experimentation sometimes can be really helpful. And it's not just vitamin D that has a potential positive effect on our mental health. There are many other nutrients that may do this too. If you'd like more information and discussion about this, let us know. In the meantime, just a reminder that this is an English language lesson. So don't forget to listen to this podcast a number of times so that your brain has opportunity to learn and really remember any new words. Enough for now. Have a lovely day. Speak to you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you so much for listening. Please help me tell others about this podcast by reviewing or rating it and please share it on social media. You can find more listening lessons and a free English course at adeptenglish.com.